roll up her, she has a roll top. We have a little stand that has a roll top, like a roll top desk, and I roll it up for her, and there's all her toys, and she's looking them all over, and now she's taking her sister's collar. There she goes with it. She picks it out, that's amazing. She picks it out of all that mess. And she gets it in her mouth, and she walks around the house. You might hear her meow pretty soon. There she goes. I should put the camera on her for you. So we were talking about Rosado. Rosado thinks there's nothing wrong with a New York State Supreme Court justice breaking the rules of the land. That is what he gets paid $95,000 a year for. Certainly he isn't there to rule on the rules. He is there to break them. Why do we have rules if they are not to be kept? Summary of argument, Jacob says, CBS liar. In brief, appellant's claims boil down to our anger that CBS refused to accept for broadcast any more of the commercials appellant submitted. Glendora says this is petulant. And typically, baby stuff, CBS. This is the Paley spoiled brat stamp on CBS. This is the Paley spoiled brat stamp on CBS, which CBS has not quite grown out of under Tish. As CBS was under no duty to accept appellant's commercials, no, but they were certainly under a duty to look at them and to negotiate them. Uh, jo Justice Rosado, Jacob says correctly, concluded that appellant could not make out a negligence claim. Wrong, wrong, wrong. CBS, as a greedy gobbler of the public's airwaves, certainly does have a duty to screen and negotiate Glendora's commercials. CBS is, in its greed, ignoring the public's trust. This is, after all, a public trust, that they have these airwaves. Remember, the airwaves belong to the public. And what qualifies Judge Rosado, negligent himself, in abandoning his post in the Westchester County Courthouse Tower for two weeks to rule on negligence? I called there two weeks. Nobody answered the phone. Moreover, as the course of the state lacks subject matter jurisdiction over any claim under the FCC, this is not an FCC matter. See, this is his attempt to uh, derail. And, of course, the judge fell for it. Now listen to this. He goes on to say, over any claim predicated on a failure to comply with the FCC Act, uh, Title 47, United States Code, Sections 151, even if appellant could have stated such a claim, and which he did not, the claim based on, well, I didn't claim that. And he's saying I didn't claim that, and yet he goes on spouting. What a lie. And if, which he did not, why are the defendant's respondents and their attorney babbling about the same? Defendant respondent attorney writes, finally, the appellant's claim that she was defamed by Bresson in their conversation fails to lead publication of the alleged defamation to a third party. That's another lie. I didn't hear it from Bresson. I didn't hear it from Margot. I heard it from Steinfeld. And if these people, these unknown people who are still hiding, made such a claim, passed it down to Bresson, Bresson passed it down to Margot, Margot passed it, passed it down to uh, Steinfeld, and then Lowry heard it, I think that's communication to more than a third person. The belief is that Beth Bresson did pass on the bad word to a third person. How else would Matthew Margo know about it? How else would Matt Steinberg know about it? Glendora heard it from Matt Steinberg. How else would Marty Daly know about it? Glendora has already substantiated this passing on to a third person in her earlier pleadings, which obviously the defendants, respondents, and their attorney are too negligent to read. So Jacobs writes, the appellant has also included numerous items in the record extraneous to this case, not at all extraneous, but they're too hot. They get too close to the truth. So uh, CBS wants to put them under the rug the way they do everything wrong. They want them struck because they get too close to the truth. They can't take the heat. This is the old CBS wheeze. The lawyer writes, Jacobs writes, the court below correctly found that there was no negligence. Well, uh, In order for the Supreme Court to sustain appellant's claim for negligence, it had to find that CBS owed appellant a duty of care. Well, they did. I paid him $25,000 cash. That the uh, CBS breached this, and it caused Glendora harm, for which he's entitled to damages. 
This is correct. This is exactly what should have happened, and it would have happened with the right judge. And it would have happened with the right process, where you have a trial. In this case, Justice Rosado properly recognized that appellant was owed no duty in the first instance. This is CBS lying again. Glendora says, in this case, Justice Rosado failed in his duty to render a decision in 60 days pursuant to CPLR. The appellant has already quoted. So the uh, lawyer goes on lying. In the absence of such a duty, there simply was no negligence in refusing to accept appellant's commercials. You see, first the lawyer, what he says, is put down, and then the uh, rebuttal to that. And so Glendora replies, the hollow men, they do not end with a bang, but with a whimper. T.S. Eliot. CBS has such a duty to Glendora and to all others in her class. But CBS has been negligent. In its greed, all of its corporate life, this is the Paley syndrome. To the public, which allows CBS the use of its airwaves, and the public, which gave CBS its corporate breath. But CBS broadcasts day is rapidly coming to an end with the encroachment of cable television. Where Glendora is able to tell this decadent, dying, dismal CBS story of avarice and irresponsibility and arrogance and law-breaking and violation of the public trust. There are ten half-hour programs of the record, the causes of action, the summons with notice and complaint, the embarrassing fluffery of the CBS motion to dismiss, Glendora's motion for default judgment, which Judge Rosado entirely ignored, entirely ignored, never dealt with it, the affidavits of service, the decision, the protest, the notice of appeal, appellant's brief, respondent's so-called brief, and appellant's reply brief. Here it is, what I showed you before, the record on appeal. The record is there. And the audio tapes are there. The programs also include the outrageously rude telephone calls by Bresson, the dodging of Stringer, that's the telephone call by Bresson, dodging of Stringer, Margot, Daly, and Steinberg, all on audio tape. This is a real documentary, a real documentary, not the truncated, opinionated shrinking of a 60-minute report on CBS 60 Minutes. It's not one of those. This is a real documentary. Glendora never got her day in court, but she got her day on TV. In fact, she got 10 days on TV. That is how many days this dismal chronicle will be on TV. The first one was on already. Uh, it was on uh, Friday, February the 25th. The following is a lie and makes no sense at all and should be stricken from the record. It is disgraceful. Jacobs writes, the courts of the state of New York lack subject matter jurisdiction over any claim asserting a breach of the Federal Communications Act. He admitted himself that I didn't bring that up. As the complaint failed properly, and so I'm just going to ask them, I'm not even going to read that to you because it's a lie. And he's admitted himself that it didn't happen. So we just have this struck from the record. Of uh, Jacob's right, appellant has no private right of action to enforce the Federal Communications Act. Not an issue. This is another lie. Appellant's cause of action is not that. It is negligences, which Judge Rosado failed to deal with. But because defendants' respondents have no defense for these negligence, they are afraid to talk about the negligences and to try to distract the court's attention with such contrivances, contrivances as the FCC digression. Folks, I just want to ask you, if you can't go to your own Supreme Court with negligences and you can't find the judge to deal with it, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Even assuming arguendo, CBS, Jacobs, paid for lawyer, writes, is really all that defendant's respondent's brief is, and, and that's all that it is. All his brief, their brief, is nothing but assumptions and arguendo. Nothing but that. All of their ple pleadings and proceedings were, all of their previous pleadings and proceedings were, nothing but assuming and arguendo. The FCC, CBS writes, Jacobs writes, 
and this comes all out of a computer, uh, has ruled several times that no private individual or group has a right to command the use of broadcast facilities. Glendora says, then why did Paley do it for a lifetime and for the wealthy? Why is CBS at the present time doing it? Accordingly, Jacob writes, to the extent appellant alleges that the CBS respondents violated the Communications Act, and this is not so, and this is not an issue, this is more smoke screening. Appellant never alleged the above. This is a figment of the sick imagination of the CBS lawyer. Jacob's running scared because he has no defense for the outrageous negligences committed by the CBS tort feasors. The decision of the negligent Judge Rosado in the court below should be reversed, and this court should award Glendora $110,000 damages. The Supreme Court also addressed the question of intentional infliction of emotional distress and easily concluded that, well, Glendora says, Judge Rosado did not address emotional disturbance. He unmanfully eschewed it and easily concluded, quote, unquote, as a cover-up for sloppily, inadequately, and negligently. And here's the law on emotional distress. Freedom from mental disturbance is a protected interest. There may be recover for, recovery for the intentional infliction of emotional distress without proof of the breach of any duty other than the duty to refrain from inflicting it. CBS had a duty to refrain from inflicting emotional distress. CBS stringer Lana Ebersuis, Bresson, Margo Daly, and Steinfeld had a duty to Glendora to refrain from inflicting emotional distress. CBS stringer Lana Ebersuis, Bresson, Margo Daly, and Steinfeld acted recklessly. How can this attorney extol tort feasance? Answer, he gets paid to do it. He gets paid to swallow his conscience, his concept of what is right and wrong, and that's what we call Dr. Faustus. Now, the court below improperly ignored the issue of slander, Glendora says. And I think I've gone over that pretty well with you. Except I want to underline this point. Judge Rosado was outrageously incompetent in dealing with CBS malice, hence libel and slander. How could Judge Rosado ignore the malice? which is at the root of this whole lawsuit. It was the malice in the defendant's respondents that precipitated the out of control and low standard unprofessionalism. It was their malice that got them into this mess. Then, being the type of Dr. Faustus that they are, the next sin was to try to escape, and when Glendora cornered them, try to lie and cover up and be cloud the pay and pay Jacobs for the same. It doesn't bother Jacobs to sell his soul. The whole thing is dehumanized but plaintiff appellant Glendora has never known CBS to be anything else in her 11 years of being their customer. The public will have the last word on this one. Glendora will read every bit of it on TV. The whole CBS story has been videotaped on February 10, 1994, Thursday. Glendora starts editing it with graphics and music at the White Plains studio of TCI, the country's largest cable TV company. Neither defendant, respondent's attorney, nor the judge deal with the damage CBS Incorporated and the other tort feasors did to Glendora's reputation. Glendora was and is not on anymore, all because of infantile malice and vindictiveness. Did you ever hear Glendora ask who started all this? Who was at the bottom of all this? Deceitful CBS will not answer. Bresson communicated the lies to Margot Steinfeld Lowry. The lies were passed on, hence slander. Further slander and libel can be committed as such by actions. Not only by words, but by actions. I think this is about the last point, and it's very important. As pathetic and insipid as all of their other whimpers, respondent's brief fails to respond to the points in the appellant's brief. See, here's the appellant's brief that I showed you before. And it has all these points in it. And CBS, let these points go by unchallenged. So, I say that the appellant plaintiff, Glendora, should win by default. They never answered these points. Second page and third page. 
No, it's like just two pages. And I'll read you these points. This decision order is late. Judge is more than a month untimely with this decision. This decision should be vacated. This decision order does not deal with the issue of the negligences of CBS that injured plaintiff. This decision leaves out two-thirds of the issue. The decision order is not made on the merits of the case. Glendora was denied her constitutional right to a fair and impartial tribunal. Defendants had no meritorious defense, but Judge Rosado ignored this. CBS does not have to worry about breaking the laws, nor about being afraid of lawsuits in the courts, because the courts are afraid of CBS. The facts are against CBS, and the law is against CBS, but the judge is for CBS. The issue was not the FCC, the issue was not the public airwaves, the issue was negligences. The issue was not slander, the issue was negligence, but Judge Rosado is led by the nose by deceitful CBS. Defendants don't have a duty of care after Glendora has paid them $25,000 cash. Judge Rosado on page 2, line 13, brushes over the gravamen of the case, negligences. Freedom from mental disturbance is a protected interest, Judge Rosado should know that and that damages may be recovered on cause of action for same. Judge Rosado brushes off negligence and follows the CBS lawyer down a deceitful detour of breach of contract when plaintiff never even mentioned breach of contract. I never mentioned it. Jacobs uses it to cover up, and Judge Rosado falls for it and discusses it in his decision, in his little puny decision. He discusses breach of contract, which wasn't even an issue. With prejudice, it's right. Judge Rosado uh, dismisses this with prejudice is right, and Glendora says yes, prejudice is against pro se, women, little people, and the right. Judge Rosado does not stand up for the public, but for the greedy big business. He doesn't stand up for you, just for greedy big business, and he's afraid of them. Judge Rosado ignores the malice of CBS, big point. Judge Rosado ignores plaintiff's audio taped evidence, it is a great system. Judge Rosado is wrong in being bullied by CBS to say Glendora cannot redress her government for wrong. Since defendants' respondents did not respond to appellant's points, since these points are unopposed, the appellant should win the appellate division's decision by respondents' default. Judge Rosado showed no cognizance of the audio taped evidence. This is another deficiency of his court, along with no oral argument and no trial by jury, which is the Seventh Amendment. Indeed, Judge Rosado's secretary sent the audio tape evidence back to Glendora instead of filing it with the county clerk. Defendants, respondents, attorney do not address the issue that Judge Rosado's decision is not legal. More than 30 days late, they hope you will not notice it. Jacobs is not even going to appear for oral argument in a year and a half. He is that cocky the appellate division is afraid of CBS. Glendora will be there. She had an oral argument last Thursday at 45 Monroe Place, Glendora versus Gannett Libel. She called quadruple judicial attention to the Texaco rule of oral argument. If you don't strike oil in 10 minutes, stop drilling. Judge Rosado entirely ignored defendants' respondents' violation of her constitutional rights. Glendora, a defendants denied plaintiff her due process. Defendants submitted their motion to dismiss Glendora's complaint to the county clerk and to the calendar clerk before serving Glendora. Judge Rosado ignored this. Glendora was in the county clerk's office on the third floor the same hour defendants filed their motion to dismiss. Glendora was in the calendar clerk's office on the eighth floor and saw the defendants' motion there. How about that? Before I see the motion, before it's served on me, they serve it on the clerks. This was long before the plaintiff ever had the complaint. Such defective servant denies Glendora's rights under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution of the United States. These respondents' briefs are rolled out by the hundreds by counsel press. They have no heart, soul, blood, sweat, or tears. Glendora's briefs bleed at every paragraph. These CBS tortfeasors do not respond to the appellant's brief. That leaves it to the appellate division conclusion. For all of the reasons stated in Plaintiff Appellant Glendora's complaint, cross-motion record on appeal, brief in this reply brief, Glendora pleads that the court reverse Judge Rosado's wrong decision and award her $110,000 plus the cost of this action and whatever other relief is just and proper. Dated White Plains, New York, February the 9th, 1994. Yours in truth, Glendora. Box 532, Glendora TV ad, Scarsdale, New York, 10583. 914-949-9495. And you see the pretty cover. I'm probably the only one in the appellate division who sends them down multicolored covers. Everybody else is like this. Now then, that is Glendora versus CBS. 
and I have something else to play you. I called up the people at CBS to inform them when they could see the program, Gondora versus CBS, Stringer, Margot, Daly, Lund, Abrasis, Bresson, Steinfeld, Stringer, and Beth Bresson became furious again. And I'm going to play you that audio tape. 25th, 1994, folks, uh, Friday at around 12.29 uh, p.m. I was routinely uh, notifying uh, the defendants uh, that Gondora versus CBS, Stringer, uh, Bresson, Lund, Abrasis, Margot, Steinfeld, and uh, Daly, the whole story was being read on TV. And I was just routinely uh, notifying people. And this one I'm going to play for you. I called Beth Bresson. So she hung up. So I called back again. And the secretary hung up, too. It's interesting now. They don't try to dodge and cover up. They just run away. This is CBS. CBS Television Network. They're in the communications business. How do they communicate? So she hung up again. I don't know if that's the last one or not.
I think all of April. Okay. And then one today will be, do you have to one today? I think it'll be on for 10 weeks. That's chapter five, I believe. Chapter five is on, but that's on a different cable company. On this afternoon? It's in Rockland. The first one goes on. Nine cable companies. It's hard to keep up with them. Everything's a different channel and a different time. I forgot the channel. You can tell she's a temporary. She's really yeah, good. Every Thursday morning. Every Thursday morning in March? No, the last three Thursdays in March. I mean, maybe the last four. It won't be the first uh, Thursday in March because that's another program. Okay. Last three is Channel 16. Channel 16. Okay. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, I want to tell you this. If a horse's nose is pointing to the north, where is his tail pointing? To the south. No. To the ground. The cock crows, but it's the hen who lays the egg. Now the reason crime doesn't pay is that when it does, it is called something more respectable. That applies to a few of these lawsuits. Dancing is the art of getting your feet out of the way before your partner steps on them. The boss asked Peter, do you have trouble making decisions? Peter said, yes and no. Ed says that the boss is a big wheel, and Joe says if you take the air out of him, he's just a flat tire. This is Glendora, and this is Glendora versus CBS. And today, this was uh, videotaped on February the 27th, uh, 1994, Sunday. And it was started at uh, 6.22 a.m., and it was over at 7.30 a.m., and this is before church. You take care and keep your courage flaming, and don't let people walk over your rights. You have rights. Stand up and fight for them. And there's people all the time who want to do that. The parasites of society. Hi there, everybody. How are you today? This is Glendora, chat with Glendora. And uh, here is what happened with uh, Glendora versus Scott Lord et al. on the... Uh, 21st of February, uh, 1994 Monday, and also the 22nd of February, 1994 Tuesday. 
4.55 a.m. we did the Glendora log. Uh, we made a grid, what has to be done each day. Two, the file is okay. Three, one hour on Gatell, copying it and getting it in order and ready to notarize and the copy uh, uh, remainder and serve and submit. Uh, four, Fredman record on appeal is not due, folks, until May the 10th, 1994. Uh, that's... Uh, it, we have that long to perfect it. And five, O'Connell, we have to keep asking, have you submitted the final accounting? We got no answer at O'Connell's at 5.41 a.m. Scott, dumb motion, what judge, what date? Yesterday, loafing. Uh, seven, videotape Glendora versus Scott et al., one hour, did what happened for weeks off, January the 24th, January the 31st, February the 7th, and February the 14th. Uh, we put the audio tape on videotape of the Scott Lord accomplice impersonating a, an officer, a police officer, and we offered $50 for his identification. And eight, the what happened log Monday and Tuesday, uh, two hours Monday and one and a half hours today, and a judge hired two ballet dancers to work in his chambers because he wanted at least two people who were on their toes. Now, as we continue with Scott Lord here, there's Bob Hope. Uh, so, uh, February the 23rd, 1994, Wednesday. O'Connell is on vacation. Marie is not in until Friday. And Karen does not know if the final order of accounting went in. Uh, the uh, Lenten service at noon and soup and a sandwich. And there's a lot of research at Pace Law Library, about 10 hours research. Glendora worked on Cablevision NASA for nine hours. This is really a Scott spinoff. And Franklin did two hours. And Franklin uh, handed in four programs to Rockland County Cable TV, TKR. There was no Scott. The Scott videotapes for four weeks are waiting to be edited. Uh, we picked up a check from a client in Newark, New Jersey, and Glendora is putting him on WNBC TV. Uh, biggest TV station in the country, MB WNBC TV, WABC TV, and WCBS TV. We ordered his airtime and we sent WNBC TV the money and the videotape for the commercial. And Glendora edited Thursday from 4 to 7 p.m., but no Scott. We're working on other projects. 25th, 1995, Friday. Phil Sweet never answers the phone, it's just a recorder. Glendora leaves messages, but he never calls back. O'Connell is still on vacation. Maria says the final accounting has not gone out and Hurley is not in. Four years this bankruptcy has been going on since January 30th, 1990. And this is past January 30th, 1994. When does the check come and when will it be over? There is $19,500 in the uh, bankruptcy account and the time on Scott today is one hour. And Bob likes the word American because the last four letters are, I can. Uh, two secretaries were talking, and one says, I know that this machine will replace three men, but frankly, I'd rather have the three men. There was no time for Scott on February the 26th, 1994, Saturday, and none on Sunday, and the time on Scott this whole week was four and a half hours. Uh, February the 28th, 1994, Monday, there was no time to work on Scott, O'Connell is still away, no judge has been appointed, and there is no hearing date. March, we are into March 1994. March the 1st, 1994, Tuesday, Glendora was in Manhattan, eight and a quarter hours, folks, listening to people testify before the committee on cameras in the courtroom. Office of Court Administration, New York State. The idea has been on test since 1987, and January, the legislature votes whether to continue having cameras in the courtroom. It's a sunset uh, vote. Some of the witnesses were CNN, uh, Court TV, uh, Fox Television, and CBS Television, Modern Courts, and Westchester's own Joseph K. West, Judge. Uh, he's the su uh, criminal, criminal supervising judge for Westchester County. And uh, he gave me a ride back to Westchester, and we had a good time talking. 
Uh, they had 30 speakers, and at 3 p.m., folks, they had only done 15. <laughs> there was no time to do Scott. Franklin found out that there is a judge conference, hence to uh, no new judge has been appointed, and Judge Duberstein will be making the appointment. He will be making the, making the assignment, and Joseph Hurley is never in. Uh, March the 2nd, 1994, Wednesday, March the 2nd, uh, Richard O'Connell's father died. That's very, very sad. That's why he was out. That's a very, very sad time in a person's life. His father sounded like such an interesting person. He went to Pratt Institute, and he's from Derby, Connecticut. That's a tough thing to go through, and we all have to go through it. But he is back, and his mother, he says, is doing pretty well. Uh, Richard got the second stipulation, reducing the claim 50% from that second lawyer. And uh, he will have the final accounting out in a couple of days. Uh, having no judge will not delay anything, he says, because it is the United States trustee who finalizes it, and that is good. And, but what about the final meeting? That requires a judge. Another huge snowstorm, and that would be number 16. It's a church, and it was great. And then we had lunch, soup and cream puffs and sandwiches. And uh, Fredman, the return date on that, as I told you, is May. We don't have to worry about that. And uh, Glendora's motion to vacate and reconsider to Judge Cattell, uh, the return date for that is uh, Friday, March the 4th. And this motion has gone unopposed by Novinsky. Glendora has to videotape Scott for the week of February the 21st and she may have to uh, hire outside editing. When your father dies, that is a tough thing to go through. His father was a graduate from Pratt Institute, a very fine school. We have another big snowstorm, number 16 of the winter, and that last big snowstorm we had last winter was on March the 30th. It's a good thing it came then. If it come the beginning of the winter, we never thought we'd make it through. Spring is two weeks away. The doctor told Eli to go to a hotel and get some change and a rest. So Eli did, and he reported that the doorman got the change and the hotel got the rest. On March the 4th, 1994, uh, telephone calls, uh, there were about 100 telephone calls in the morning and in the afternoon worked on another appellant's brief and edited from uh, uh, 2.15 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. No, from uh, 3.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., but there wasn't any Scott. And we did all the old backlog of editing, except for one videotape, 8 millimeter 3C. That backlog goes way back, folks, to the first quarter of 1993. It's a year old. Judge Cattell is not in the clerk, uh, is not in the office. That means it is in chamber. Uh, judge, the Judge Cattell file is not in the clerk's office. That means it's in chambers, and that means he's making a decision. Uh, that's my uh, motion to vacate and reconsider. The Hempstead police say that Scott Lord has a license to operate a business in the village of Hempstead and they don't care about anything else. That's what they cover. It covers them and they don't care whether he's breaking the law in Nassau County or not. Uh, this is mighty peculiar about the Hempstead police. Glendora and Franklin wrote out the protests uh, to the uh, Pickin letter. I'll read you the Pickin letter shortly. Uh, Glendora talked to Chief Clerk Joseph Hurley. He said that the new judge is Marvin Holland. And I said, does that mean I'm in Dutch? We will all get an official notice. Glendora told Clerk Hurley that Trustee O'Connell told her that he hoped to get out the final accounting in the next two days. Judge Holland prides himself on being an expediter. He's in Brooklyn. That means anything that we have before the bankruptcy court now will be in Brooklyn. Well, that's good. So things should move along nicely. And now Judge Holland, uh, Glendora asked uh, where Judge Holland was on the fifth floor, and Joseph Hurley says, no, the fourth. Glendora has been in that building a few times when she came out of the appellate division in Brooklyn, just a few blocks away. She has seen the courtrooms with nobody in them as happens too often in courtrooms. Glendora asked Clerk Harler Hurley how long it would be before the check would go out, and he said Memorial Day. That's outrageous. It was supposed to be April Fool's Day, you remember? 
Sonny McLean called while Mr. Hurley was on the line, so Glendora introduced them to each other. Uh, all you have to do is have a speakerphone, speakerphone on the outgoing line and speakerphone on the incoming line. You have to have two lines. And uh, you're going to have a conference call. And then I can use my third line, my third telephone, which is 5742-949-5742. I can use that and have a third person in the conference. Or anybody in the room can be in the conference because they can be heard. Now, Sonny is one of Glendora's videotape editors. Franklin left a message on Phil Sweet's uh, recorder at Consumer Affairs protesting Pickens' viewpoint. And Friday afternoon, Glendora edited from 1.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. a chat with Glendora. The old backlog has gone, folks. It has gone. It's melted down like the snowbanks. The new backlog is one-third gone. The Scott Chapter 30 and Scott Chapter 31 are ready to go to the cable companies to be table ca uh, telecast. And after the uh, Scott work is done for Sunday, Glendora hopes to get all the videotaping up to date. Then Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday finish all the editing. So that each Thursday all she has to edit is what happened the last week, the week before that. The time on Scott, Thursday, is zero. Friday is two and a half hours. Saturday is one hour. And the teacher said to the little girl trying to learn addition, if you put your hand in your left pocket and you had 65 cents, and then in your jacket you put your hand in the right pocket and you had 35 cents, what would you have? And the little girl said, somebody else's jacket on. From Commissioner James Picken. Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, Nassau County, Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, James E. Pickin, Slim Pickens. Dear Glendora, this is to acknowledge receipt of your recent letters to this office and the county executive's office. Please be advised that we have added them to your file. As you are aware, Scott Lord is not licensed with this office. Therefore, we are unable to assist you in this matter. I have attached a copy of a letter dated uh, June the 11th, 1990, addressed to you regarding this matter. That goes back four years. I would appreciate it if you would adhere to our request. Well, a slight chance of that. And here is the letter that he wrote in 1990, which you've already heard. Uh, in reference to your letter of June 2nd, 1990, you have been advised by us and by the county attorney on numerous occasions that you do not have a consumer complaint in this office. Your relationship with Mrs. Scott Lord was strictly a business transaction. It is unfortunate that you were not able to collect your judgment. Well, we cannot. Uh, we are not a collection agency. Regarding the information you have provided, but I have collected it. It's in the uh, bankruptcy account now. The district attorney has not indicated as of this date there is any legal action that we can take against Mr. Lord at this time. As you are aware from the freedom of information request you have filed, Mr. Lord is no longer licensed by this agency. His last license request was denied in February 1990. If you require any further information, you are free to file a freedom of information request as you've done in the past. However, do not expect my staff to waste the dollars of Nassau County taxpayers by repeating the same facts and arguments ad infinitum. I do not intend this agency to be used as a weapon for anyone to carry out a personal vendetta. Isn't that crazy? I hope you understand that I feel no further communication is called for unless some new and vital information is submitted to us in writing. So that tells you what's wrong with the Office of Consumer Affairs. It's their commissioner, James Pickin. No end. And Franklin wrote this letter to James Pickin. Mr. Pickin says the Department of Consumer Affairs is not a collection agency. Glendora is not making OCA, uh, is not asking OCA to collect anything. In fact, it has already been collected by the bankruptcy court. Your statement that OCA can do nothing in relation to Scott Lord because he is not licensed with his office is puzzling and shocking, Franklin writes. Our current concern is that Scott Lord is indeed operating an underground lawn sprinkler business without a home improvement license from the OCA, the Office of Consumer Affairs. One of your functions is to protect legitimate businesses with licenses from the competition of unlicensed contractors, as well as to protect consumers. The present situation, which you can easily confirm, is that Scott Lord is operating at 17 Center Street, Hempstead, under the name of the Scott Lord Group, Atlantis Lawn Sprinkler Group, and Forever Green. 
Your own words, he is not licensed by your office. Therefore, you have a responsibility to prosecute him under Local Law 6, the same as you did several years ago, uh, have, that is, have him prosecuted by the district attorney. Why don't you move on this, Mr. Pickin? That is what we are pointing out. That is what it is your duty to do. By your reasoning of no action because of no license, everybody in Nassau County could be doing home improvements without a license. Everybody. And the OCA would sit by, Office of Consumer Affairs, would sit idly by, protecting nobody and sloughing off its reason for being. Sincerely, Franklin F. Buell, Glendora's husband. 1994 Sunday, there's no time for Scott. We're working on a big project. In fact, it took 27 and a half hours. The time out for church and communion, no time to videotape for TV, and six hours on Scott this week. And that ends the week of February 28, 1994. Uh, this is what happened on Glendora versus uh, Gannett, uh, Mitchell Broder, John Curley, McCorkendale, Watson, uh, Gary Sherlock, Kenneth Paulson. Uh, and this is what happened the week of uh, February the 21st, 1994, Monday. Uh, Glendora finally got rid of the pressure jobs and sat down and videotaped what happened, Glendora versus Gannett Broder, for the weeks of January the 24th, January the 31st, uh, February the 7th, and February the 14th, and it took one hour. It will be Chapter 61, I think. And what entry won the soap box? Uh, what entry won the soap company contest? The soap company had a contest. What entry won? The entry that won was, if you don't use our soap, for heaven's sakes, use our perfume. On uh, the February 22nd, 1994, Tuesday, 1 at 6 a.m., did the Glendora log, uh, made a grid what to do this week, in what order. Two, the envelopes for the Broder mailing to go out today, return address and address, 21 people. Broder had an article in the newspaper Monday night, Lifestyles, 3D art. Uh, the first one since February the 16th. The file is in fine shape. Three, the lawsuit. We read three pages of discussion on jury demand, uh, making a demand for jury. That's the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Decided that the one that Glendora made out Sunday was good, so we copied it, and uh, we signed the affidavit as service, and it's ready to notarize, copy, serve, and submit. Uh, we went over all the other legal papers that have to be signed today, notarized, copied, served, and submitted. As the clerk in the appellate division said last week to Glendora, you are running quite a law firm there. Whoosh! Glendora does not want that. All she wants is to stand up t on TV and tell jokes, or to sit down on TV and tell jokes. 5, 7.25 n, a.m., what happened, Log? The time on Broder today will be two and a half hours. A comedian received an award for his jokes, and he thanked the four people who made it possible, uh, his four writers. Robert Schuler received an award for his sermons, and he thanked the four people, his writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. February the 23rd, 1994, Wednesday, the Lent service at church and lunch at church, 140 telephone calls. Glendora found out that the appellate division caved into big business, naturally, and denied her pleas to overturn Burroughs' rotten decision. So it is just another anti-prose, anti-female, anti-little person, anti-honest person, and anti-justice cave-in. Uh, February the 24th, 1994, Thursday, Glendora worked on Cablevision 11 hours. She edited at TCI a lot of Cablevision, but no Broder. Broder had a story in the paper. Uh, February the 25th, and I think it was about snowballs. A man has collected snowballs for 10 years, <laughs> and he keeps them in the freezer. GCI, Gannett Corporation Incorporated, uh, what Gannett Company Incorporated, was at 53 thereabouts. Glendora found her rule on appeal to a court of appeals. Glendora has quite a law library in her offices. And right away she found the form. So that will go off as soon as she receives the papers from Kalaji, from Gannett. Uh, it's up to them to send us a copy of the decision with a notice of entry, a written notice of entry. When they do that, the day that they do that, uh, Glendora's time to take an appeal starts to run. And how long is that time? Do you know? It's 30 days. 140 telephone calls today. Finish reading the rules. 
and uh, forms for demand for jury. And the Broler log did go out Tuesday. And it cost a whole lot of money. It cost something like, oh, about $30 to print it and post it. The demand for jury did go out. Glendora told the judge and law clerk in the lower court that she had her chance to say what she thought about them before the appellate division. That would be Judge uh, Gordon Burroughs and his law clerk, uh, Charles Devlin. So the time on Broder today is two hours, and we are up to date uh, on Broder. That's 4,400 pages. Our files are 4,400 pages on Broder, and it's a record of corruption. What is a bargain, folks? Something you can't use at a price you can't resist. February the 26th, 1994, Saturday, no Broder, videotaping other series. February the 27th, 1994, Sunday, no Broder, doing other jobs. The time on Broder this week is five and a half hours. And the week of February the 21st, 1994 week. February the 28th, 94, Monday, no Broder, too busy on other things. And we're up to March, March 1994. Oh boy, spring in three weeks. March the 1st, 1994, Tuesday, in the court building at 111 Center Street, folks, in Manhattan, listening to hearings on cameras in the courtroom. That's where I'm writing this log. I can't do it on my typewriter. And um, uh, a woman, a reporter from Channel 5 just spoke, and Judge West, who is our very own judge from Westchester County Court, uh, is speaking now at 3.02 p.m. He's also the supervising judge of criminal for the Westchester County. Elizabeth Hubbard of Modern Court spoke. She's the one we sued for negligence for letting us do all of that work and never publishing our reports. Do you think that we would have gone out and done 100 hours work and spent all that gasoline and all that tolls through all the snow and through all the ice and all those days monitoring the courts in Peekskill, Port Chester, Rye, and Yonkers? You think we would have gone out and done that if in the beginning she had said we're not going to publish the reports? Judge uh, Conboy, the judge on the Professor Jeffries case, you know, the New York University Freedom of Speech case, he spoke in favor of uh, cameras in the courtroom. In fact, I would say the speakers were 9 to 2 in favor of it. 3.45 a.m. on Wednesday, the Glendora log do the filing, and the article Broder had in the paper, as I told you, was about snowballs. This is... Uh, a page of the day calendar of the appellate division, the day that I made my oral argument, and the judges caved in to big business. Uh, a week ago Monday was about a man, oh, I told you that. 4.10 uh, a.m., do the filing and paginating. What is taking Broderick so long? We have to get a new judge. Glendora will call the pro se clerk, but the line is busy for days. Who in the courthouse in White Plains would know? The new courthouse is in its underwear, a skeleton of steel. It's down at the quarter of Quaropus and Lexington, or Fisher and Lexington, whichever you want to call it. Glendora went by it yesterday, indeed, every day, at least three times. The time on Broder today is one hour. It's only about four or five blocks from where I live. The doctor told Ernest to give up golf, and golf says, why? Because of my health? And the doctor says, no, I saw your scorecard. Uh, March the 3rd, 1991, Thursday, 120 telephone calls this morning. I worked three hours on another appellant's brief that has to be in at the same time as Fredman. Edited 3.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., but no broader. Uh, March the 4th, 1994, Friday, edited 1.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. equals nine hours. The cost was $260. Isn't that a ripoff? Videotape editing? The stuff is expensive. Uh... I resolved the problem of having programs ready to hand in to cable companies, to cable cast, and not ha handing in any repeats. Now, that's why I went out and paid for the editing. See, at TCI, uh, the e editing doesn't cost because it's public access, and that's a great, big, wonderful institution, public access. You do this under a 600-watt light, and you get very thirsty. Uh, it's like the swallowing of a sponge. But there was a problem. All of a sudden, it hit me like a lightning bolt that, gee whiz, if I didn't get out and get this editing caught up, I wouldn't have new programs to hand into cable TV companies. And you know, I never repeat a program, even from one cable company to the, to the next. 
Each cable company gets a program that's never been played and never will be played on any other cable company. And then on the same cable company, I never repeat the same programs there. I never repeat programs. We have enough new programs for the next two weeks now and for all the nine cable companies that Chat with Glendora is on. Broder editing was one hour and is up to date, chapter 61. Broder is the longest of all the series. There are nine series, and Broder is the longest. On uh, March the 5th, 1994, Saturday, Franklin wrote out his reaction to the bad appellate division decision. Glendora has her notice of appeal already to type. Uh, Kalaji has not sent Glendora a copy of the decision with a written notice of entry. That is when her uh, appeal starts to run. If he does not do this pretty soon, Glendora will write up the notice of entry. And that's a simple form. Kalaji will probably write a letter instead. <laughs> he is so bad at writing legal papers. Gannett was going for 54 and a, a quarter. Glendora always tells the person who gives her the quote a joke. It brightens up their bleak day. Glendora asked the pro se clerk what could be done when your poor judge is sick to move t uh, things along. It is not right. Another judge should be called in. Broderick denied Judge Carey's complaint that Judge Carey uh, did not have to retire now. Judge Carey doesn't want to retire. He's 70 or something, and he has to retire, and he doesn't want to. And uh, he works hard uh, while most of them are out on the golf course. Glendora finished her protest to the uh, bad decision of the appellate uh, division. She will, let's change that. It says appellate term here, and there's a big difference. You know the difference, don't you? The appellate term is for appealing bad decisions in the lower court when the lower court is a city court or a village court. And the appellate division is for appealing bad decisions in the Supreme Court, of which there are so many, or the county court. She will read it on videotape tomorrow. The time on Broder Thursday was zero, one hour Friday and one hour today. Do you know why do people laugh up their sleeves? That's where their funny bone is. All right, here's this bad decision from the appellate division. And this decision is written by, they say, these judges, but it's more likely written by some law clerk, 22 or three year old law clerk. Thomas R. Sullivan, presiding justice, Fred T. Santucci, Gloria Goldstein, and Anatar, no, Anitar, our Florio JJ, Junior Justice. Uh, okay, the case number is 04545 of 92. <laughs> this is 94. That's how long it took him. Decision in order. Glendora the Appellant versus Gannett Suburban Newspapers at all respondents. They're so lazy they can't even write out the names of the defendants. Well, I'm going to tell them to you. Gannett Suburban Newspapers, uh, John Curley, Gary Watson, Douglas McCorkendale, Kevin Gray, Elizabeth McCormick, and I think that's all. No, I think what's his name was here who went to Larry Beaupre. I think he was one of the defendants. Glendora, Scarsdale, New York, appellant pro se. Uh, Sadly, Stevens, Burke and Burke, and that's a uh, Kalaji lawyer. In an action to recover damages for defamation, the plaintiff appeals from an order of the Supreme Court, Westchester County, Judge Burroughs, entered April 30th, 1992. And this decision gets to us on uh, February 22nd, 1994. Which granted the defendant's motion to dismiss the complaint of libel? And denied the plaintiff's cross motion for leave to enter a default judgment against them. They were late. If you're Gannett, the Supreme Court will let you go by. Ordered that the order is affirmed with costs. Now, they didn't have to put with costs in there. This action was commenced by the plaintiff against the newspaper based on an article which reported a previous lawsuit between the plaintiff and the newspaper. That was Judge Johnston in the court of Harrison. New York, and the court's decision dismissing her complaint in that case. A comparison between the article and the court's decision reveals that it was substantially accurate and therefore a fair and true report of a judicial proceeding within the meaning of Civil Rights Law Section 74. Wrong, wrong, wrong. 
Uh, contrary to the plaintiff's contentions, the accuracy of the report was not altered merely because the article did not contain the plaintiff's side of the judge's decision. That's the way you write, uh, I guess that's the way you do everything. You write newspapers without taking the other side. You make decisions in court without listening to the other side. I guess that's the way things go now. Similarly, the fact that the article did not report that the plaintiff appealed from the court's decision does not alter the accuracy of the newspaper's report on that decision. No, but it makes the plaintiff look mighty bad. And it would make uh, Gannett look bad if they printed it. So Gannett didn't want to look bad, so Gannett didn't print it, that the decision was appealed the next day, Judge Johnson's decision in Harrison. The isolated statement that the plaintiff could not be reached for comment yesterday, even if untrue, does not deprive the paper of its substantial accuracy. No way. Why would they go on paragraph after paragraph quoting what Gannett had to say about the decision and then deliberately lie and say that they couldn't reach Glendora? so that Glendora would have something to say about the decision. These people are bad. They're really bad. I don't know how they sleep at night. In any event, we do not find that these words considered in the context of the uh, entire publication are reasonably susceptible of a defamatory connotation. Dead wrong. Accordingly, these words are not actionable as a libel separate and independent of the privileged report of the judicial proceeding. It's outrageous. The plaintiff's allegations regarding the newspaper's malicious publication of the article are also without merit. How can they do that? You know, you either got to be very, very dumb or you got to be playing for the political boss. Don't upset Gannett because we need that newspaper endorsement at election time. Since the report is fair and true, and it isn't, the privilege set forth in Civil Rights Law number, uh, Section 74, which they've already quoted, is absolute. It is not. They lost their privilege because they lied. And because of reckless newspaper reporting, they lost their privilege. And it is not defeated by the presence of malice or bad faith. Oh, you're bad people. Concurring in part and descending in part. Uh, and on concurring, oh, I don't know what this is talking about. Some dumb cases. We have reviewed the plaintiff's remaining contentions and find them to be without merit. And this is uh, uh, all concur, Sullivan, Santucci, Goldstein, and Florio. Martin H. Brownstein, the clerk. And this I paid something like, oh, probably $1,000 for. $170 for an index number, $75 to buy a judge in the uh, Supreme Court in Westchester. That would be Burroughs and his law clerk, Devlin. And then uh, $250 to buy four judges down at the appellate division in Brooklyn. And then $200 to have the whole thing copied. Easily, that piece of junk costs $1,000. Don't look for justice in the uh, Supreme Court in the state of New York. Franklin says about this decision, or so-called decisions, decisions never seem to be a blend. They don't take into account uh, pertinent issues. This decision sets aside facets of not giving balance to the report by listing your side and not mentioning the appeal, which seem to be worth more than the court gives them. Decisions are not human. Franklin Buell wrote that. OK, here's my, uh, I'm all ready to appeal to the Court of Appeals. That's the next court up. Notice of appeal to the Court of Appeals. Please take notice that the above-named appellant, that's Glendora, hereby appeals to the Court of Appeals from the order of the appellate division of, fill in the blank, what was it, February 22nd, Judicial Department, duly entered herein on the 22nd day of February 1994, which order affirmed, which order affirmed the judgment of the Supreme Court of Westchester County, entered herein on the, what's the call it date? I think it was in April. Yeah, April 30th, 1992. That's all there is to it. You date it and put in White Plains, and then you put in Glendora, and you put in Pro Se. Uh, March the 6th, 1994, Sunday. No time for Broder working all the day on other stuff. The total time this week on Broder is three and a half hours. And the new library patent, patron says he was dazzled by what you could do with a little library card. He says, you mean with this little card, I can take out any book that I want? Yes. 
You mean with this little card I can take out any VHS I want? Yes. And I can take out any CD that I want? Yes. And I can take out any librarian that I want? No. The librarians are for reference use only. And that ends uh, what happened on uh, the week of uh, February 28, 1994, uh, Glendora versus the Broder crowd. I will read you my protest uh, on this appellate division decision. Glendora's TV report on the bad decision of Solomon Santucci, Goldstein, and Florio, March the 1st, 1994, Tuesday. It is rubber stamp. These judges, like oracles, announce these lofty opinions and all these citations. Then they rule by the seat of their pants anyway. There obviously was a breach of contract. There obviously was libel. There was no fair and true report of a judicial proceeding when Gannett Gray said the case was about Glendora's asking to get paid for the time spent being interviewed when Glendora never said such a thing. And when the article printed only one side and quoted all those Gannett people, how can these judges sell their souls and say this was a fair and true report of a judicial hearing? How? Because that is what the political bosses want. Do not rile Gannett. We need the Gannett endorsement at election time. When a reporter does not write the truth, how can a newspaper article be called a fair and true report of a judicial proceeding? One thing is for sure, you cannot trust judges. Judges have no judgment. And to blind themselves to the malice, so blatant, even a second grader could see it, is an outrage. Glendora has asked the courts to help her over 15 times, and they never have. They always stand up for big business, for the lawyers, for the men, for the money. They are anti-pro se, anti-female, anti-little person, anti-stand up for what is right. She has spent over $10,000 seeking justice, but it is the worst consumer ripoff she knows. The courts are so far gone, nobody can reform them. It is hopeless. Glendora will stick with TV where a crook is called a crook and not a lawyer. And costs, they did not have to do that. This is David and Goliath. Gannett, Gannett is a multi-billion dollar company, and these four judges rule costs that I've got to pay Gannett's lawyer's fees? That's sick. Glendora spent eight and a quarter hours in Manhattan yesterday watching the Office of Court Administration Committee hear witnesses testify as to the need for cameras in the courtroom. They are needed. The public has to see that judges do not have judgment. What you read here will be read on TV. This is not liberty and justice for all. Rewrite the civics books and tell the kids what courts are really like. Judges rule for what is best for judges. The courts are hopeless. And here's today's joke. One attorney wrote to another, Sir, I regret to inform you there is danger of agreement between our respective clients. Yours in truth, Glendora. A chat with Glendora and Glendora TV ads. To a lawsuit, antitrust which is such an obvious thing. You live here in Westchester. You know that Gannett is antitrust. Uh, here's a, a case. The First Amendment does not afford absolute immunity from antitrust liability to members of the communications industry. That's the United States Code annotated Constitutional Amendment 1. General telecommunications General Telecommunications Incorporated versus TCI Cablevision Incorporated. That's a little federal, uh, this is federal digest. See, they take all these cases so you can see what they're about and so you can look them up to support your case. Okay, I don't think there, I told you enough jokes here in this report. It was too dull. All right. Uh, why does Santa Claus have three gardens? Why does Santa Claus have three gardens? So he can ho, ho, ho. How many months have 28 days, the teacher asked the class. And the little boy says, they all do. Why did Robin Hood rob the rich? The poor had no money. This is Glendora versus Gannett Broder and all those other people. And this is what happened 
on the week of uh, February 28th, uh, 94. Take care. Watch out for your... Everybody, uh, this is what happened on Glendora versus uh, the DHCR, William Street DHCR, and Judge Coppola. Uh, on uh, the week of February the 28th, Monday, we worked on another series all day, 14 hours, uh, and to the committee uh, hearing on cameras in the courtroom. Uh, that was eight and a quarter hours uh, in uh, the first day of March. March is here, 1994, and uh, Glendora rode home with Judge West. Uh, I did a lot of research at Pace Law Library, and Franklin did it with me. On March the 2nd, 1994, Wednesday, 180 telephone calls from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then worked on two other series. On the March the 3rd, 1994, Thursday, 120 telephone calls, finished the income tax form. Now we can relax until April the 13th when we will send it in. And the mother-in-law says, my son is honest. He put down on his 1040 form that half of his income was unearned. Uh, 2.30 p.m. Uh, started the DHCR, uh, William Street and Coppola, to make up for all the days that we had missed. And we finished uh, cataloging and writing the points from the first 100 pages of the record. You take the record on appeal, this great big thing here, and the record on appeal is the record of all the legal action, the summons with notice and the complaint and the other side's answer. And in this case, they didn't answer on time, so I made a motion for default judgment. And uh, then their opposition to that, and then the attorney uh, general of New York State was a lawyer for uh, Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo would have been better off pro se. And then you answer all his papers and so on. That's the whole, everything that went before the judge. And then the judge's lousy decision. And then uh, uh, the, uh, then the notice of appeal. So that's the record on appeal. And I looked at the first 100 pages and I made notes of all of the points of my argument. Uh, before the appellate division why this decision should be reversed and I should receive my uh, $110,000 or was it $70,000 or what. Uh, then I wrote the points and then at 3.30 p.m. I dressed up to edit at TCI, chat with Glendora, and we did four other series but no uh, uh, DHCR. 8.50 a.m. a man called from Manhattan. He was watching a chat with Glendora he was negative, and he was a coward, and he was probably from the D William Street DHCR. That's the way they do. They won't leave their name, their number, or their address. And, uh, but he performed a very valuable service. He told me that the cable company was cable casting it correctly. They're very good, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. They are very good. They have never missed. They have never missed cable casting a program. Excellent. Uh, at 9 p.m., another man called and wanted the happy book. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, at 9 a.m. The DHCR series is all over in Manhattan. It was a different series this morning. In fact, what was it about? Oh, it was about Michael Gelman at WABC-TV, the producer of uh, Live with Regis and Kathy, who lost my videotape and, who, and, and whom we have asked, uh, I think it's 200 times, to make good and he just keeps running away. Nothing else will be on TV about the DHCR until I finish this brief. And, uh, that'll, and it's not, uh, it doesn't have to be perfected until May. The time on the DHCR, William Street and Coppola today is one and a half hours and Arthur said a college degree is a poor substitute for an education. Uh, at, uh, on Friday, we edited a chat with Glendora from 1.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., eight hours, and i uh, forgotten what it cost. It was something like $250. One hour of that was the DHCR, William Street, and Coppola, Chapter 17. The Coppola tapes came back from Manhattan yesterday, Chapters 11, 12, and 13. They have been cable cast. On March the 6th, 1994, Saturday at 4.10 p.m., now I'll do the DHCR for Friday and Saturday. Glendora's log is up to date. The file is in order. 
uh, look at pages 201 to 300 of the brief, excuse me, of the record on appeal. And I wrote down what points to make for the argument for the appellant's brief. Lindor wrote a letter in support of Judge Carey that he does not have to retire. He is a hard-working judge. Lindor would go to courthouse in an afternoon around 4 to 5 p.m., and uh, he would be on the bench. And all the other uh, judges were out playing golf or doing something. Uh, judge Carey is really dedicated. We need more judges like Judge Carey, and he should, be not, he should not be made to retire. And fewer like the ones we've got. We need fewer like the ones we've got. The points are all written out for the table of contents. They're written out. They have to be typed. They are scheduled to be typed tomorrow at 5.30 a.m. The time on the DHCR today is one hour. That was a terrible decision that Judge Coppola made as I read it over. How can anybody get that far off from justice and the law? A farmer planted his onions next to, he did this so that he would never have to water his potatoes. He planted onions next to the potatoes so that the onions would make the eyes of the potatoes water. That's a Judge Ingrassia joke. Judge Ingrassia's father was an onion farmer up in Florida, New York. Now we're up to Sunday, and at 5.45 a.m., Franklin indeed typed the first two pages of the table of contents, listing the first nine points of the argument. And the time on the DHCR, William Street, and Coppola today is two hours. Uh, and uh, altogether this week it was five hours. Programs 1428 and 1429 are DHCR, William Street, Coppola, Chapter 17. They are scheduled to be seen on Yonkers Cable TV March the 26th and April the 2nd, just missing April Fool's Day. Channel 37, Saturdays at 8.30 a.m. Paul said, uh, paid $800,000 for a pre prefabricated house. He paid $800,000 for a prefabricated house. Isn't that expensive? Well, he had it sent airmail. And here again is the picture of the new housing commissioner and the new head of the uh, DHCR who replaced a Ponte who was so bad and who was the cause of the lawsuits, that, the two lawsuits that Gondor brought against the DHCR. And it seems to me that you should have another joke, that this is altogether too serious. Uh, if a maple tree has 10 branches, folks, and each branch has 15 acorns, how many acorns are there on the tree? None. Acorns grow on oak trees. If a plane crashed on the border of France and Germany, where would the survivors be buried? If the plane crashed on the border of France and Germany, where would the survivors be uh, buried? You don't bury survivors. Now what is the difference between a little boy said to his daddy, what is the difference between electricity and lightning? And his daddy says, you don't have to pay for lightning. You take care. This is Glendora, the chat with Glendora, and this is what happened on uh, the DHCR at William Street and Judge Coppola uh, the uh, week of uh, February 28th, 1994. Hey buddy, here's what happened with uh, Glendora versus Lydia Gallicano et al on the week of uh, February the 21st, uh, 1994. Uh, Monday was a loafer's day. Everybody, instead of working, they were loafing. Uh, Glendora videotaped what happened with Lydia, et cetera, from January the 24th to uh, February the 20th. That was one hour. We touched up uh, the order to show cause to return the $1,250 to Glendora. Uh, Thursday, Judge Ingrassi's office said that the order granted was effective February the 8th and beyond, and therefore Glendora couldn't collect her $1,250. She'd have to wait for the outcome of the appeal, and if it was in her favor, she could take the $1,250 by restitution, and that there was nothing to worry about uh, because uh, she could attach the, uh, put a lien on the property 
at 42 Longview Avenue and at 40 Longview Avenue. Now, uh, the, uh, the law secretary uh, in the administrative judge's office uh, called uh, the uh, White Plains City Court and asked to speak to the clerk. And uh, that would not be Marie Cookter, that would be Jean Wald. And then Jean Wald passed the call over to uh, Kathy King Ritchie and uh, asked, why did Judge Holden uh, take $1,250 from Glendora? And Kat, uh, Mrs. Ritchie's answer was, as a condition of her trial. And uh, Mr. Farina said, well, does Judge, often, does Judge Holden often do that? And I don't know what the answer was to that. That was on the telephone. But then uh, Mr. Farina said to, to me that that was a uh, very bad practice. Well, it's bad practice. It's, it's downright unconstitutional is what it is. I'm going to be entitled to a trial just as you are, no matter what. And uh, no judge can take $1,250 from me uh, as a condition of a trial. It's a constitutional guarantee. This is, after all, the United States of America. Do you remember back uh, when he did that? I asked him to put it in writing six times, and it was totally ignored. He would never put it in writing. And uh, he did this in open court on uh, November the 13th, Friday, uh, 1992. And by the 18th, he made me pay. So I had to pay. And then don't you remember, a year later, uh, he told the Commissioner of Finance to release that money to Lydia Gallicano. And the appeal uh, hasn't even been decided. And so they have the money, and they shouldn't have the money. And Kathy King Ritchie uh, sent uh, the order of release uh, to the wrong address, and I didn't get it until six days late, and that didn't give me time enough to get an order to show cause to stop the Westchester County Commissioner of Finance from sending it to them. And Judge Ingrassia wasn't there so that he could have signed the order to show cause. So I was a victim on the courts on three causes. One, Judge Holden is pro-landlord. Two, uh, Judge Ingrassia wasn't there to sign the order to show cause to stop this. And three, uh, a negligent clerk, or maybe she did it on purpose. Uh, sent it to the wrong address. And that's how you get ripped off for uh, $1,250. In appeals generally, Glendora found the answers to Gallicano asking for an extension and with no good cause show, uh, an extension to get in his brief. And that's uh, appeals generally 5514 in the CPLR. This is simple practice law and rules. Uh, the Amicone reply brief has been read on TV, it's 22 minutes. The time on Lydia this week is three hours. Uh, I have to get out this what happened log tomorrow. And uh, I think this is it right here that I'm reading. Uh, and a minister volunteered to give lectures at a prison. And the prisoners got together and uh, they said to the warden, we protest these lectures, warden. They were not part of our sentences. Well, everybody, here it is in the uh, New York Law Journal. <laughs> they got it down as uh, Lydia and Lawrence versus Buell. Well, if anything, it should be Lydia and Lawrence Gallicano versus Buell. But that's still wrong. It should be Lydia and Lawrence Gallicano versus Glendora. Anyway, there it is under the court calendars. And it's scheduled for uh, March the 8th, uh, 1994, Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. And here's what happened the week of uh, February 28th. Uh, Lindor is working 14 hours on another series. And on March the 1st, 1994, Tuesday, eight and a quarter hours in Manhattan, in Manhattan at hearings office of uh, court administration on cameras in the courtroom. Uh, there were many judges, lawyers, and public testified. Our Judge West was there. Judge Conboy from the uh, Professor Jeffries case was there. Court TV was there. CNN, CBS appeared. There were over 30 witnesses. And Glendora went to the county courthouse to see about Sheridan's claim. Glendora is a non-party. There was no need of Sheridan doing that, you know. Uh, 
because I uh, signed the affidavit Glendora instead of Glendora Buell, he wrote back to Glendora Buell uh, that I was a non-party. That's ridiculous. So I had to run around and get that settled. Uh, what I did do was to take it up to the uh, uh, administrative judge's office, and I showed it to him. And so I went downstairs and wrote out an affidavit that Glendora and Glendora Buell are one and the same person. And I had it uh, notarized, and then I brought it back up to the 11th floor to the administrative judge's office. And he said uh, that he would have that mailed in tomorrow, or I could mail it in that night. So I mailed it in Tuesday night. Uh, there was a brief report on Channel 8 uh, Tuesday night, TCI, about Glendora versus Lydia. Now, on uh, March the 2nd, 94 Wednesday, I did 180 telephone calls, and I worked on another series, and there was no time for Lydia and Glendora versus Lydia, and here's Katie Cat. was on TV for a half an hour in Harrison and Port Chester. It was on Channel 45, and it was about Judge Donovan. Uh, on March the 3rd, 1994, Thursday, uh, only 140 telephone calls today, I uh, edited a chat with Glendora for three and a half hours, and I made up Lydia work uh, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Glendora logs in the files and paginate, and I'm up to page $5,000 5, on Glendora versus Lydia Gallicano. The records and files in brief are out of the bin in preparation for the oral argument on March the 8th, Tuesday, before the appellate term. I did seven pages in preparation for the oral argument. We spent two and a half hours tonight on Lydia. And how can you tell a good judge? You can always tell a good judge or that a judge is good by the worried look on his law clerk's face. Uh, on March the 4th, 1994, Friday, 80 telephone calls in the morning. Lindora was suddenly struck by the thunderbolt that if she did not edit and edit a whole lot, she would not have her programs ready to hand in to cable companies next week and the uh, next week after. So she edited from 1.30 to 10.30 p.m., that's nine hours, and paid $210 for it. And two of the hours were for Lydia, chapters 22, no, 27 and 28. And those were programs 1430 and 1431. On Saturday, uh, March the 5th, uh, one and a half hours on Lydia, uh, the Glendora log returned two files to the basement archives. Filing, paginating, reading Glendora's appellant's brief. The brief is really well done, folks. It's really a good brief. Here it is. I had written this a long, long time ago. And then when I picked it up to prepare for the oral argument, I really found out how good the points were. And I've read you this brief. So she's pretty nearly uh, ready for the oral argument Tuesday. Lydia Ornberger cannot argue because they did not submit a brief. You have to submit a brief in order to have an oral argument. Uh, Glendora talked to the appellate term Friday. It took three and three quarters hours today to file, label, plan, and schedule all the programs that were edited yesterday. There were 10 of them that I edited, 10 half hours. Glendora scheduled Lydia Chapter 27 and Chapter 28 on White Plains Cable TV, Channel 14, for March the 21st and March the 28th. They are about the reply briefs and other things that happened January 24th to February 20th. I edit over at Sunny McLean. Uh, that's in Terrytown. That's the place where I slid down the hill sideways on a sheet of ice, terrible hill going into the Hudson River. A counterfeiter went into a store and said, will you cash this $18 bill? And the store owner said, sure. You want two nines or three sixes? Uh, March the 16th, 1994, uh, Monday, there was more preparation for uh, the oral argument. And uh, I know what happened at the oral argument now, but I have to wait until next week to tell you, because that's where this week closes, the week of uh, February the uh, 28th, 1994. Ginny's in her toy box now.
folks, how you doing? This is uh, what happened with Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin on the uh, week of February the 21st, uh, 1994. Uh, Glendora's third doormat is stolen, and Franklin discovered it at 8.30 a.m., and the prime suspects are Roberta Walsh and James Walsh, and that's number 607. Tortious act. Glendora reported it to Officer Fisher. He wrote a report on it. And why doesn't he come up here and arrest her? Glendora is getting tired of this law breaking. At 2.22 uh, p.m., a cruiser with a policeman in it was parked in the Walsh spot for 10 minutes, drove away, came back, and was parked on the west side of Greenwich, pointing south. After a half hour or so, he left. He must have been watching for Glendora's stolen doormat. Number three. Uh, February the 26th, 1994, Saturday, doormat number four is stolen. The last time Glendora saw it there was February 25th, 1994, Friday at 8.30 a.m. when she and Franklin put down the doormat number four. It lasted less than 24 hours. The prime suspect is Roberta Walsh and James Walsh, number 608. Monday was beautiful weather, 62 degrees, seventh day of it. Isn't that wonderful? And Tuesday it got cold, Wednesday was snowstorm number 13, Friday was another snowstorm, the ice is dangerous, there is no salt put on the uh, sidewalks. It's bad maintenance. Glendora called the police about the doormat number four. She recorded it on audio tape and played it on videotape for her program. Saturday, Glendora laid down the incident the third Saturday in January when the White Plains police refused to answer a summons to come. Thursday, the re, uh, records office could not find a police report by Officer Fisher about stolen doormat number three. Saturday, we had no hot water and no heat. Bob Pepe from Regent uh, Oil Company was here Saturday night until 2.40 a.m. trying to make it work, and he came back again Sunday at 7 a.m. to get it going. And now at 2 p.m., he's down there working as hard as he can, and we have no hot water and no heat. That is very sad. That is the boiler that we are paying for every month, the extra charge of something like $28 a month we're paying uh, for that, uh, that furnace. It's really not fair. There are so many thieves here, we will have to take our doormat in at night. John Porzio was here at 11.06 a.m., checking to see, that's on Sunday, if the hot water and heat was on, and at that moment it was. Porcio looks good, and he has no pot belly. A pot belly stove would be nice right now. Glendora wrote out an answer to Judge Donovan's recusal. It is enclosed. Franklin looked at the file in the county clerk's office. There's nothing there but the summons, the so-called answer, and the RJI. Monday, he will look at the file in the chambers. Uh, that would be in Judge, uh, Judge Wood's chambers and make sure we have everything in it. He is the new judge, Judge Wood, because Judge Donovan did recuse himself. Why didn't Wilson have Andrew Larkin read their so-called answer and sign the affidavit before Wilson sent it to Glendora? This is a crazy law firm. But then what other kind is there? See, this is what I'm asking you. This uh, came from Wilson, Bobby, Comboy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is Malcolm Wilson's uh, law firm, 2 William Street. As dear Glendora, on January 11, 1994, we served upon you our answer, along with various demands and clothes. Please find a copy of our client's verification of same relative to the above captioned manner. Matter, very truly yours, Wilson, Bobby, so forth, Alexander. Karamitsos. And I say, it is so dumb not to name Larkin, not to have Larkin read and sign before sending the so-called answer to Glendora. Now, don't you think so? And here is his uh, verification that he read it. I, Andrew Larkin, being sworn, says I am a defendant in the action herein. I have read the annexed answer and know the contents thereof, and the same are true to my knowledge, except those matters therein which are stated to be alleged on information and belief. As to those matters, I believe them to be true. 
Dum Dum, January 21st, 1994. Leela Wood Smith is a notary. She's that woman in Harris and who stood up for all kinds of environmental good things. She worked down there, you know, when they wanted to uh, ravage the land, and she stood up for it before the Harrison Town Board. Okay. You've seen this already. That's uh, Judge Donovan finally recused himself. That's the first page, and that's the second page. And this is Glendora's answer to Judge Donovan's recusal. Now remember, he had two cases of mine. Uh, Glendora versus Daniel Walsh, Roberta Walsh, James Walsh, Nella Alpucci, Theo Alpucci, Andrew Larkin, and Kevin Larkin, and Glendora against Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, and the Fund for Modern Courts. So I wrote to him and I said, in your order recusal you write, but since any adverse ruling is going to add to her complaints, it would be a disservice to these defendants to remain on these matters. Plaintiffs' own taunts and attempts at intimidation themselves ought to be bootstrapped by her as reasons for recusal are obviously part of a judge shopping plan on her part, as this is the second court. Something about one of these actions that has apparently displeased her by virtue of prior rulings. Okay, folks, I say this is blatantly anti-plaintiff. And uh, then he goes on to write, the court is sorely tempted to engage plaintiff's attempted intimidations, but, def but deference to the ultimate procedural and substantive rights of all of the defendants will cause this court to reluctantly recuse itself. So I write that this is shamelessly pro-defendant. He's anti-plaintiff and pro-defendant. I rest my case. That's what I said all along. Please keep the record straight. How all of this happened, Glendora refused to take the guff your staff was giving her. They got angry and they told you. Then you got angry at Glendora. And in anger, you cannot give Glendora her constitutional right of a fair and unbiased tribunal. What you read here will be read on TV. Channel 45, Wednesdays, 8.30 p.m., Cablevision, Harrison, and Channel 8, Tuesdays, 9 p.m., TCI, 21 towns in Westchester, and on seven other cable companies, including Time Warner Manhattan. Point two, plaintiff was damaged by your taking so much time for this recusal, something like 40 days. Plaintiff has only 180 days to complete this action. Plaintiff may need that 40 days that you squandered. I used to like Judge Don. He told good jokes, and I told him good jokes. What you read here will be read on TV, Channel 45, Wednesdays, 8.30 p.m., Cablevision, Harrison, and Channel 8, Tuesdays, 9 p.m., TCI. Uh, dated White Plains, New York, February 8, 1994, Glendora, and it's notarized by Francis Herensing. And it's to every person listed on page six and to Judge Angelo and Gracia. And I ask him, D Judge Donovan, why did you send a copy to Judge Ingracia? Glendora has two cases before Judge Ingracia. Are you trying to prejudice him? And here's the affidavit of service. And here's the list of the 23 people that this goes to. We'll have to have a joke. A man called a hospital, and he says, I'd like to know the condition of James Parsons. And uh, the person who answered the phone said that Mr. Parsons uh, is improving, and he's resting comfortably. Uh, and he had a restful night. Who was calling? And the man says, James Parsons. They won't tell me anything. 
put on Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin on uh, February the 28th week, uh, just after the log closed on Sunday. Uh, Roberta Walsh and James Walsh were in the hallway unloading groceries from that red truck to their second floor apartment. Glendora opened her door and watched to see that they did not steal her doormat, number five. James Walsh, juvenile son, gave Glendora truculent looks, made stomping noises, and went out to the red truck telling his mother that Glendora was doing things when Glendora was doing nothing but protecting her doormat. Roberta shouted at Glendora. It was vile. Glendora did not say anything before, during, or after all of this. Roberta hurled insulting and abusive language. Roberta made derisive quack-quack sounds six times, even though things were not ducky. James Walsh let forth blat sounds and spit sounds, and words like lunatic were used. And Roberta, going up the stairs, shouted, Daddy, come on down here and see this. There was nothing to see but Glendora in her doorway making sure her fifth doormat did not get stolen, as did the four before it. But Daddy, Daniel Waltz, did not come down. Instead, he urged son and wife uh, uh, to come into the apartment and to desist. This was intent to annoy and disturb what Roberta Waltz did and James Waltz did with no legitimate purpose. Uh, so the defendant's conduct was so outrageous and shocking as to exceed all bounds of decency as measured by what the average member of the community would tolerate. Defendant's conduct caused severe mental distress to the plaintiff, and defendant acted with a desire to cause such distress. Where severe mental pain or anguish is inflicted through a deliberate and malicious campaign of harassment or intimidation, a remedy is available in the form of an action for the intentional infliction of emotional distress. Where defendant's conduct is extraordinarily vindictive as this is, it may be regarded as so extreme and outrageous as to give rise to a tort cause of action for emotional distress. And that's what we have before Judge Wood. Insulting or abusive language, New York adheres to the majority view uh, that insulting or abusive language can be actionable. It is, if it's sufficiently outrageous to a person of ordinary sensibilities, uh, both when the language is alleged to have caused purely emotional distress to the person to whom it is directed. It has been held that even in the absence of a contemporaneous bodily impact or injury or of acts constituting an assault, a cause of action is properly predicated upon a mental or emotional disturbance, or upon uh, disturbing utterances, such as profane, insulting, humiliating, or abusive language, and that's what you just heard. Both Roberta Walsh and James Walsh are liable for damages. Glendora worked 14 hours Monday on another series. There were no police reports from Officer Fisher from uh, February the 21st, 1994, Monday. Officer Dual, spelled D-E-O-U-L, called before he went to direct traffic at Hamilton. Then he called after coming back, and a man with three vowels in a five letters name has to be very special, D-E-O-U-L. He is like Judge Bryant, B-R-I-E-A-N-T. 5.36 p.m., Nella Alpucci blasted her horn five times outside our east bedroom window. Chapter 45, Glendora versus Walsh Alpucci and Larkin was on TV at the time. It was program number 1,403. It is, on Monday, it is on Mondays, every Monday on channel 14 on uh, White Plains uh, cable television. Glendora reported that the intent to annoy and disturb in the insulting and abusive language, she reported that uh, to the police. Now this is March, and this is spring month. Spring will be here in three weeks. Uh, March the 1st, 1994, Tuesday, Glendora is eight and a quarter hours in Manhattan attending a hearing on cameras in the courtroom held by the Office of Court Administration, New York State. Many famous people spoke, judges, lawyers, and the public. Uh, our judge, West, spoke. The witnesses ran about nine to two in favor of cameras in the courtroom. The warmest trial was very often mentioned. There were no police reports in the records. Uh, Franklin found doormats number three and number four in the shrubbery outside the front door. 
This is a queer thing for the thieves to do. Ferdinand Alpucci, the father, tooted his horn twice outside our east bedroom window. And what number is that? That's number 611. 3 p.m., Lieutenant Quinn called about the reports. Our chat with Glendora was on TCI at 9 p.m., Channel 8, Tuesday, for a half hour, and there was no wall program. Franklin checked the Walsh file in the county courthouse tower, and it has the right papers in it. On March 2, 1994, Wednesday, two men in a white plains truck asked who was the super here, and somebody complained about the ice on the sidewalk on the Rutherford Street, on the Rutherford Street side. Glendora told them how she had taken a flip on her gluteus maximus on the sidewalk three panels uh, north of the front door hallway on the Greenridge side, and that uh, salt should be put down. Glendora did 180 calls Tuesday and 140 Wednesday before and after the Lenten noon church service, and Franklin brought home all three police reports. There's one report. Now this is by Officer Fisher. Report over the phone, complainant called and reported that between the above time at above location an unknown person stole, it's not unknown, it's Roberta or James Walsh, stole a doormat from her threshold to her apartment. Value of the doormat was two dollars, nothing further, nothing further, something taken at this time. No, they never take anything further, they never take any further action. Insert Glendora called the White Plains Police Sunday on a charge of harassment, intent to annoy and disturb, and on abusive and insulting language, but the White Plains Police did not answer the summons. No protection, no enforcement. Glendora recorded the telephone conversation and will play it on TV. It is too bad. When the police do not answer summons, it makes things look very bad. We have had 17 snowstorms this winter. How does your son-in-law get his exercise? And the mother-in-law says he jumps to conclusions, he runs up bills, and he stretches the truth. Abe went back to his hometown. The first four people he met did not recognize him, and the next five did not know he had left. Here's a couple more police reports. This one is by Officer Duell. Spoke to the above complainant by telephone regarding a larceny of a floor mat. Complainant stated, unknown person stole her floor mat, uh, valued at $2 from in front of her door. This is the fourth time it has happened. The mat was lost, was last seen on February 25th, 94, at about 1900 hours dual number officer, officer number 108. Here is the second one by dual to Buell. He likes to use uh, the name Buell. Spoke to the above complainant by telephone regarding a harassment complaint. Complainant stated that Mr. and Mrs. Walsh are harassing her. They are calling her a lunatic and giving her lingering looks. Uh, these actions took place in the hallway of 21 Greenridge. And Glendora says wrong. James Walsh and Roberta Walsh. Daniel Walsh did not do anything wrong. It is hard to keep the driveway clear because people do not move their cars when the snowplow comes. Franklin handed out the mailing uh, Wednesday without incident. No more of them are returned. The cost was $10. The time so far on wall this week is five hours. 11.39 p.m. read the law for four days. Glendora has a client on WNBC TV Channel 4 tonight at 2.11 a.m. She may stay up to see him. It costs $300 and it's 100,000 viewers. Knock, knock. Who's there? Morris. Morris who? Morris Saturday, next day Sunday. 
Lest we forget, what started this? The breaking of the law by the Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin families, the White Plains Noise Ordinance, which says, and they did this on April the 11th, 1993, Easter. And the White Plains Noise Ordinance says yelling, shouting, hooting, hollering, whistling, or singing at any time or place so as to disturb the quiet, comfort, repose, health, or peace of persons in any dwelling or other residence. That is the law that was broken initially. And when Glendora stood up for her rights and began videotaping her evidence, instead of reforming, said hoodlums started a long campaign of retaliation and more law breaking, harassment, vandalism, thievery, abusive and insulting language, horn blowing, fright, mental disturbance, and littering. Lest we forget who started this. That's how, that's when, that's where, and that's why. Remember well. On March the 4th, 1994, Thursday, 120 telephone calls in the morning, worked three hours on an appellant's brief, not due until May. I edited a chat with Glendora, laying down the video and audio, character generator, and background music from 3.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. This was at TCI. There was no time for Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin. We made it an inside doormat, folks. Since there's so many thieves, uh, we put the doormat inside. It seems like we're entitled to have our doormat outside, but with the thieves around here, we can't do that. Why is it the Walsh family cannot afford to buy a doormat? So our doormat is inside our home rather than outside where it should be. The door closer does not work down on the east cellar door. And is that more vandalism? On Friday, we have heat and hot water. Bob Pepe did a great job. He really worked at that problem until he solved it. The snowplow came, but people did not move their cars for the man. His name is, uh, oh, he's a nice young man. He's very good looking. Glendora asked the woman if she would move, in 1A, if she would move her car and told her she could park in Glendora's spot. Uh, Daniel Walsh was upstairs all the time, but he would not move uh, the Rinaldi plumbing truck that was parked there. He should have come down and moved it, and then the uh, man, Chris, Chris, Chris's name, he could have plowed it out. 100 telephone calls in the morning, and the chief clerk of the bankruptcy court called Glendora, the chief clerk of the Eastern District, and told her who the new judge is. It's Marvin Holland. Glendora said, does that mean I'm in Dutch? Uh, the chief clerk, Joseph Hurley, thinks Glendora will get her check from the bankruptcy court estate by Memorial Day. Back in January, the word was that she would get it on April Fool's Day. It suddenly hit like a lightning bolt that unless Glendora did some video editing fast, she would not have enough programs to give to the eight cable companies next week and the week after. So she edited from 1.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., nine hours at a cost of $260. This stuff is not cheap. She did 10 programs, 1422 to 1433. Wall Chapter 47 is done, and it tells what happened from January the 4th to February the 20th. March the 6th, 1994, Saturday. It took three and three quarter hours to do a chat with Glendora scheduling, labeling, planning, filing, packing. The Wall 47 Glendora scheduled for White Plains, cable TV, cha channel 14, 5.30 p.m. April 14th. The Wall 47 continued program, 14.33, is scheduled for the following week on the same channel, the same day, and the same hour. It tells about the White Plains police not coming when summered and plays the audio tape. It is not a pretty record by any means. It also plays Glendora telling this to Officer Kleinbill. The time on wall today is one and a half hours, and the devil challenged St. Peter to a baseball game. And St. Peter says, I don't see how you can win. All of the good players are up here. And the devil says, yeah, but all the umpires are down here. So that's it, folks. March the 7th, 1994, Sunday, we had peace. There were zero hours on wall today. Uh, it was eight hours for the week. And the joke of the day is, the boss may be mean, but at least he's fair. He's mean to everybody.
blue juice. Looks like you're drinking uh, window washer fluid. I'd like to have you say hello to Katie Cat. Katie Cat. You want to say hello to the people? Katie Cat. Right this way, Katie Cat. Look to the people. Oh, what a pretty lady. What a pretty lady cat. Yeah. Versus Russell Brower in the week of uh, February the 28th, 1994. Uh, Vincent Pereira, who was the uh, court stenographer down in Yonkers, uh, said that he would have the minutes all typed and will be send them to Brower on March the 9th. And that's about a week earlier than he said he would have them. Uh, we spent four and a half hours on uh, Brower this week, and mostly it was t <laughs> this is Katie Cat. She's playing with the gloves. The thing is, is that the gloves are on my hand. Look here. Look who here. Uh, four and a half hours this week, and most of it was on uh, editing Brower. Uh, there's quite a few programs. Uh, there's uh, 1415 is Brower 1, 1416 is Brower 2. 14, uh, 17 Brower 3, 1420 Brower 4, 1421 Brower 5, 1422 Brower 6, 1423 Brower 7, and 1433 uh, is Brower 8. And so that's the thing to do is uh, Russell Brower receives the minutes from Pereira. And I think Russell Brower has uh, 15 days, according to CPLR, to look over those minutes and to make any uh, changes that he wants or to say that this is wrong or this was admitted. And then he submits them to me. And then I have 15 days to read the minutes and uh, write down uh, any objections that I have to them. And then Russell Brower has to settle, get an order of settlement of these minutes before the judge in the Yonkers court. And once the minutes are settled, then the uh, Yonkers clerk has to mail the record on appeal to the appellate term. And after the appellate term receives the record from the court, then Russell Brown's time to perfect the appeal starts to run, and that's 90 days. And so he has to get out of an appellant's brief served on me within 90 days. And I believe that's all the news today on that. Katie Cat. Katie Cat. <laughs> she feels pretty frisky. Uh, the boss said, Young man, how long have you worked for this company? And the young man says, Six months, sir. And, uh, the boss says, how much money do you make? And the young man said, $200 a week, sir. And the boss says, well, I'm exceedingly pleased with your progress. I've been watching your work very closely. And I am going to uh, give uh, you a promotion. He says, starting tomorrow, you're going to be the vice president of operations. And the young man said, oh, gee, thank you, Dad. Take care. This is Glendora versus uh, Russell Brower, and that's what happened the week of February the 28th, 1994. Okay, folks, this is what happened with Glendora versus uh, Cablevision NASA, uh, Cablevision Systems Corporation, Charles F. Doan, William J. Bell, Mark A. Lusgarten, Francis F. Randolph, Jr., John Tata, James A. Kofalt, Joseph Asnara, Thomas Garger, and William Quinn. And uh, this is from the log. On uh, February the 25th, 1994, Friday, there was another dumb letter from Kalaji, abridging my freedom of speech. Glendora will send her answer to the defendants. He should be in the...